navigate around in and through and ask us. It is my pleasure to invite that wonderful jewel that is Carol Campbell to share the message with you this morning. Not only does she make and create, create with precious stones and, and, and jewels, but truly she is that precious jewel herself. So please put your hands together and welcome Carol. We'll bring the message. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> From one jewel to a host of jewels. <laughs> It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living here in sunny, warm Jamaica, and a special welcome to those who are joining us on the World Wide Web, wherever you are. Ernest Haverman has written, you can see them alongside the shuffleboard courts in Florida or on the porches of the old folks' homes up north. A little old man with snow white hair, a little hard of hearing, reading the newspaper through a magnifying glass. An old woman in a shapeless dress, her knuckles gnarled from arthritis, wearing sandals to ease her aching arches. They're holding hands, and in a little while they will totter off to take a nap. And then she will cook supper, not a very good supper. And they will watch television, each knowing exactly what the other is thinking, until it's time for bed. They may even have a good soul-stirring argument just to prove that they still really care. And through the night, they will snore unabashedly, each resting content because the other is there. They are in love. They have always been in love, although sometimes they would have denied it. And because they have been in love, they have survived everything that life could throw at them, even their own failures. Isn't that wonderful? I think most of us who come from a certain ilk can relate to this as our parents. You know, my parents were the hopeless romantics. The neighborhood would know when there's a moonlight night because they'd be strolling up and down the avenue, hand in hand in the moonlight. <laughs> I've taught, titled my talk this morning, What's love got to do with anything? Our Declaration of Principles states, we believe in the eternal goodness, the eternal loving kindness, and the eternal givingness of life to all. Now how would we choose to live if we really believed this? Life is eternally gifting us with everything we could possibly require or desire to live abundantly right now. Yet very often, too often, we find ourselves running around seeking out there for evidence of the great promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. If God is all equally, evenly present, and one of the attributes of God is love, then it stands to reason that love must be equally, evenly present. So must also be where we are. To go a step further, if we are expressions of God, created in the image and likeness of God, it means we must be love also. That which is a part of us can never be a part from us. Once we come to this understanding, this realization, we recognize that the very essence of who we are is not some scarce commodity to be parceled out and grudgingly shared with a few who we consider worthy. We can give it freely, without strings attached. As Ralph Waldo Trine is quoted as saying, the life that goes out to all is the life that is full and rich and continually expanding in beauty and in power, end quote. There are really only two ways to approach life, either as a victim or as a victor, from fear or from love as the reactor or the actor. Think about that. When we approach life from the perspective of expressing our divine nature, our true reason for being, everything automatically falls into place. You ever notice that? And seeming imperfections sort themselves out without much effort on our part. 
When we allow the love that we are to flow freely from us, we come to really understand that there is never a moment, never a place where love does not penetrate. This love is ever present and has always been present. It has been the courage we needed to step out in faith. It has been the tenderness of a mother's touch, the passionate embrace of a lover, the blush of a new romance. It has been the strength we needed to stand our ground. It has been the innocence of a first breath. It has been the light in our darkest hour, the shield that protected us, the power that has sustained us. It has found a way when there was no pathway. It has healed our wounded hearts and gifted us with second chances. While the feelings associated with love are incredibly beautiful, love is so much more than a feeling, isn't it? The energy of love is transformative. And once we have glimpsed the power of love, once we have tasted its sweet elixir, we'll never be satisfied with less. Anybody can attest to that? You ever been in love? <laughs> That's why our whole quest through life seems to be an attempt to recapture that essence. But if we make that quest our primary activity, we miss the whole purpose of being, the whole point of love. Right where we are, exactly as we are, we have all the love we will ever have. Yeah. We came to this existence fully loaded, lacking nothing. So how come we're seeking to get this, get that, get the other, when we already have it? Well, if we don't know that we have it, it doesn't do us much good, does it? Suppose you had a long lost relative who you hadn't seen in 30 odd years. They died and left you a fortune for reasons unknown to you. But you're not aware of this because no one can find you to tell you the good news. So here you are sitting on more money than you could ever dream, but you're not aware of it. So you can't benefit from it. All of us, whether we're aware of it or not, have been touched by love. It is the awareness, though, that frees us to demonstrate the love we are in all circumstances. We don't need to be loved by somebody. We are already loved totally and unconditionally. We need to love somebody, to be a blessing to somebody, to add value to someone else's life. How do we do this? How do we love without expectation? Is it possible to love when the object of your affection doesn't love you back? Can we love the seemingly unlovable? Emma Curtis Hopkins, who Jackie read this morning, was a teacher of our beloved Dr. Ernest Holmes, who is the founder of this teaching known as the Science of Mind. And she states, and I quote, whoever gets into a state of overflowing, unquenchable love is manifesting the Christ self. In that state, we see no evil in anybody or anything, seeing only their good. We receive no injury at anybody's hands. We rejoice in all that occurs. Love diffuses all with its power. Having love, we have strength, so we radiate strength. Everything has a light and a life and a joy and a renewal of pleasure in it for us, which nothing that happens to us can destroy. In this state, there is nothing for us to do. The rains of charity and mercy will fall on the great deserts of our life, and they will bloom with happiness." End quote. The circumstances and activities of our lives are not why we're here. They're not our purpose for being. The soul, our higher self, is not seeking after success or love or happiness. It is not concerned with being a great artist a member of the Fortune 500 Club, being the strongest or fastest athlete. These are effects. The soul is success. It is love. It is happiness. All the good stuff was given in the beginning. Therefore, the circumstances of our lives are simply channels 
through which we are given the opportunity to express our true self, which is God. So whenever the vagrancies of everyday life rail up and threaten to get in our face, the first question to ask is, who am I being right now? You know, I remember years ago, the first Science with Mind class that I was taking with Dr. Elma Lumsden, our founding minister here, the first task we were given was to answer the question, who am I? Well, everyone proudly rattled off the usual suspects. Your name, accomplishments, your job, occupation, family relationships, you no know, husband, wife, sister, brother, mother, doctor, lawyer, in the chief. I don't recall one single person at the time identifying with their God nature, probably because most of us were not even aware there was such a thing. And furthermore, most of us coming from religious backgrounds were saying, I am God, was blasphemous. We never even thought about it. In fact, most of us thought, well, why is she asking us this silly question? You know, we thought we were terribly bright. <laughs> But it's a very important question that leads to the true discovery of your true self. To get to the answer, we must become aware, awaken to the reality of our soul. It takes a willingness to understand and the courage to set aside preconceived notions and acceptances regarding our spiritual self. God is all there is. So if we exist, we must be part of this allness, no less than the moon and the stars. Within this allness, the qualities of God must be expressed. Patience, love, peace, joy, wisdom, wholeness, prosperity, these must be expressed, not just talked about or known about, but experienced. So if the first question is, who am I? The next question usually is, why am I here? If we answer, I am God, to the first question, we'll see that the only reason we're here, our sole purpose, is to be nothing more, nothing less than what we truly are, God in expression. So you say, so how do bills going to get paid? I have to work. Sure, nobody's stopping you from working. As a matter of fact, if you connect with your soul's agenda instead of trying to do your own thing, you'll be unerringly guided to do the thing that is yours to do. That will be the change agent in the world, and it will be effortless. Seek ye first the kingdom, and all these things will be added unto you. And where is this kingdom? Within. So, to connect with the soul, we need to go within. Through the practice of meditation, contemplation, prayer, visualization, reading spiritual literature, taking classes such are offered at our centers, commune with nature, sing, laugh, make love. <laughs> People agonize entire lifetimes over this question when it's simply a matter of surrender. Be still and know. Once we connect with the soul, then we inevitably make different choices that benefit not just us, but show others the way to find their own soul and thus allow the free flow of our divine God nature. So, what does all this have to do with love? From the Science of Mind glossary we read, Love is a cosmic force whose sweep is irresistible. Take that. We live in an orderly universe that is governed by spiritual law, and love is the fulfilling of the law. What does that really mean? Ernest Holmes in the Science of Mind textbook says, and I quote, love is the sole impulse for creation. It is the very reason for our being. The man who does not have love as the greatest incentive in his life has never developed the real creative instinct, end quote. In other words, if our activities are not motivated by love, we're on the wrong track. The expression of love, the experience of love, 
is as essential to our existence as breathing. Quite literally, life depends on it for growth and expansion. Newborn babies die without it. Plants wither without it. Animals display personality disorders without it. That's true. I have two dogs. <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson, in his essay on love, has this to say, and I quote, it is a fire kindling its first embers in the narrow nook of a private bosom, caught from a wandering spark out of another private heart, glows and enlarges until it warms and beams upon multitudes of men and women, upon the universal heart of all, and so lights up the whole world and all nature with its generous flames. Let us suppose for a moment that these statements are true. Love is a cosmic force. Love is the sole impulse for creation. Love is a fire that warms and lights up the whole world. That's powerful stuff. But what if, instead of waiting to feel more love, or trying to find more love, we decided to accept that we are indeed the love we seek? Then the statements could read, I am a cosmic force. My sole impulse is for creation. I am a fire that warms and lights up the whole world. You want to say that together? OK, I'll read it. I am a cosmic force. I am a cosmic force. My sole impulse is for creation. I am a fire that warms and lights up the whole world. I am a fire that warms and lights up the whole world. How did that feel? Powerful? I got goosebumps. <laughs> How would you live if this became your guiding principle? What if our real purpose is to prove to the world to all and sundry that love exists by demonstrating its reality every minute of every day. Well, I have good news, and I have bad news. The good news is martyrdom is not a requirement. You don't have to polish up your halo and become another Mother Teresa. You can start right where you are, as you are. The bad news, well, there is no bad news, really. Just the realization that this requires total commitment to be always present and fully available to love, to fearlessly let love have its way with you. Remember, we're either acting out of love or out of fear. But what is there to fear if we believe that God is love? God is good, therefore love is good, and we are this love. Love cannot harm, love heals. Love only loves. If love is a cosmic force whose sweep is irresistible, and I am part of that, I can afford to let go of my little insecurities, my doubts and fears, my relationship dramas, and ideas about what I don't have or who needs to love me, etc. All of these reflect fear-based ideas of limitation. Do we need that? No. All we need is love. Thank you, John Lennon. <laughs> and we already have it. And it's free. Free. We don't have to earn it, bargain for it, strive for it, fight for it, work for it. To live is to demonstrate our innate ability to love. And to love is to enable the transformation of the entire cosmos, and in particular, our world. I'm going to invite Jackie to come up here for give us a brief demonstration of everyday miracle that happened quite recently that speaks about living in love. Jackie? Uh, good morning again, church. <laughs> um, last week, Saturday, I was called to a meeting with my lawyers, who is doing, have a matter for me. Um, in that meeting, they told me that by the 24th, that's tomorrow, 
I had to pay um, to the tax administration people an amount in seven figures. <laughs> now, I am not speaking luck or anything like that, but um, in my immediate, what I looked at, it was almost an impossibility for me. And I was flabbergasted, although I didn't show it, because it was very sudden. I had no idea this was coming up. So I was very calm and cool. I am a well-taught practitioner of the science of mind. <laughs> anyway, um, when I walked out of the lawyer's office, my legs were very rubbery. <laughs> and I was feeling less than I'm trained to feel as a practitioner although I did do my treatments. I contacted my practitioner and my friend, Carol Campbell, and I told her of the matter. And Carol said to me, Jackie, it is already done, right? <laughs> and she treated, and then she also said to me, remember, Prove me now. Now I know that prove me now in Malachi is all about tithing, but it is also about our lives and our faith in God. I can't say I relaxed, <laughs> but I, I also did my own treatments. Well, the long and the short of this story is to tell you that Wednesday, last week Wednesday, I was able to go to my lawyer's office with a check in hand for seven figures. Treatment works, people. <laughs> so what's love got to do with anything? Everything. Love is the prime motive power of the universe. And as Emerson said, love is a synonym for God. All, problem, all problems in life can be summed up in a lack of love, or more precisely, the fear of the unavailability of enough, whether it's enough love, enough money, enough of anything. But that is a baseless fear, because love like God, is as eternal as the heavens, without end, perennial as the seasons, ever available, and relentlessly abundant. The more we give it, the more there is to give, and the more opportunity there is to give and to receive. Love is something we give, and the getting is incidental and automatic. In the words of Helen Hayes, the truth is that there is only one terminal dignity, love. And the story of a love is not important. What's important is that one is capable of love. It is perhaps the only glimpse we're permitted of eternity. Namaste. <laughs>